thank you for praying and praying for the uh, proclamation of God's word and his truth this day, and I'm grateful to be able to be here with you. Um, often in our services, we read the scripture appointed for the day, and some of you will be pleased to know that we're not reading first, or Ephesians chapter uh, 1, 2, and 3 today, although that would be a fairly short reading, or 4 through 6 next week, or 1 Timothy chapters 1 through 6 the week after. Uh, long scripture readings are part of what happens in the scriptures as you look at Nehemiah, you look at the book of the law in Deuteronomy, that they would stand. Can you imagine that? Stand for hours while the entire book of the law was read aloud. Men, women, and children standing for hours. That's a, uh, we think, oh, do I have to? Well, yeah, we get to. So those are the opportunities that we have as we come to the scriptures is to consider what God has in store for us uh, in the letter to the church at Ephesus. We've been looking at this uh, church at Ephesus the last few Sundays and Paul's ministry there and the work that Paul is doing in the church. And uh, as, we, as we did that, we looked last week in uh, the, the book of Acts written by Luke uh, to discover uh, some things about that city of Ephesus and how it is that Paul ministered there. And I'm going to show you a few pictures just at the outset here. Uh, and uh, this is the goddess Artemis who reportedly fell from the sky um, and not in that shape. Uh, that certainly human hands have shaped that, uh, that idolatrous statue. And uh, so you can go to the next picture and you can see there's what's left of her great temple. Uh, not a lot. And, uh, and yet you can also, if you look very closely, you can see a human form just to the left of the base of that monstrous column and to think how many columns there were and what a magnificent place of worship that is. If you look up on the hill uh, behind it there, you see that kind of dark uh, fortress kind of building. That's a hill where it is uh, um, thought that the Apostle John uh, was living during his time in Ephesus, and from that location, uh, he wrote his uh, letter to letters to the churches in Ephesus. First John will be looking at it in a few weeks, and also his gospel was written from there before his exile to the island of Patmos. But that's in Ephesus. And then the next picture shows you the uh, the amphitheater of Ephesus. Uh, it had been enlarged under the reign of Emperor Claudius to be able to seat about 20,000 people. And uh, there's a large amphitheater. And can you imagine for two hours people standing in that amphitheater shouting again and again, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Make Artemis great again. Uh, those are the kind of things that they wanted to shout and to give glory to this goddess who fell from the sky. But this week we're looking at Ephesus and the letter that Paul wrote to this church at Ephesus to remind them of the gospel. Paul is imprisoned in Rome um, about four or five years later. This is A.D. 62 when uh, Paul writes his letter to the church at Ephesus and he wants to encourage and instruct and remind them of some basic aspects of the good news. And that's the meaning of the word gospel. You know, gospel means good news. And in the Greek is euangelion. And so that means good news in Greek, the good announcement. Um, and so, and so we, from that word euangelion, we get our good English word evangelism. And so that's what we're doing. When we tell people the gospel, we're telling them good news. Now, do you know what good news is? Besides the gospel. I hope you do. You know, it, it will be good news that day when we are singing in this auditorium without masks on and the sounds of the songs of the saints soar over our heads and we hear one another singing with clarity. That'll be good news. Mm. I read this morning in the news something that struck me though as odd news and perhaps frightening news. Maybe you've seen this story that there is a Chinese rocket booster that is on course to make impact with the moon on March 4th of this year. Huh. Has anyone read this story? I'm a pioneer. It was originally thought that this was a SpaceX rocket booster from Mr. Elon Musk, but it's not. 
It's been identified as a Chinese rocket booster. Wow. Launched in 2014, this rocket booster is now on its way to the moon. It weighs four tons. And it's traveling at 9,000 kilometers per hour. That's faster than a speeding Bugatti. That, that's just an amazing thing that's going to happen. Can you imagine the impact of that thing on the moon? What's that going to do to the tides? What's that going to do to the climate? Oh, what's that going to do to the earth? Will the moon break up and then fall into? No. You see, if you get that news about the moon is about to be crashed into by a rocket booster, then you say, oh my I need some counsel. I need some advice. I need some help because I don't know what to do. Well, let me give you a little bit of reassurance. This has happened often since 1959. Rockets and parts of space trash crash into the moon. This rocket booster is expected to create a crater about 65 feet, about 20 meters wide. Huh. Okay, and it will join the other bits and pieces of space trash on the moon. Now, the bad news is this. It's scheduled, expected, to make impact on the dark side of the moon. So we don't even get to see it. But it's supposed to be true. See, that's, Martin Lloyd-Jones made that great distinction between the gospel is good news, not good advice. When the news of victory comes, then you rejoice. When the news of disaster comes, then you make your plans. How do we react? How do we fix this? You know, for those of you who don't know, tonight at uh, midnight plus 30 minutes is the Super Bowl. I am not a great American football fan, but my hometown team, the Cincinnati Bengals, is playing in the Super Bowl. If I happen to wake up at 2 a.m., I might just flip it on and see what's happening. And you know what would be for me good news at that point in time? Bengals lead the lousy Los Angeles Rams 49-3. to That would be good news. Then I could just say, okay, I go back to bed. But if I find that the Rams are ahead 17 to 14 in the fourth quarter, then, ah, that's time for strategy, planning. We need counsel. We need advice. How are we going to pull victory out of the jaws of defeat? Do you see the difference? And the gospel that Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus is drenched in good news. And as I've considered what it is that I want to proclaim to you as the people of God in MICC over the last weeks of my ministry here, I want to proclaim messages from God's Word that are drenched and dripping in gospel goodness. And that's what I aim to do. Because this is for you and for me to strengthen us, to encourage us, to help us to understand what God has done. So much of what we see in our world and the understanding of what people think they know what the gospel is about is nothing more than good advice. Do this, five steps to make your marriage happy, three steps to make your life happy, four steps to personal prosperity and health. All of the things that people are supposed to do to make their life better, but the gospel says no. Oh, take a look at what God has done. And that's what the letter to the Ephesians is about. Now, first a note about grammar. And grammar really does matter. I love being in a group of people who are multiple language experts. Or at least multiple language amateurs. Because you understand how language works. And when I say a word like indicative... You say, I get that. Whereas sometimes in the, the land of South Carolina in the United States of America, you, you say indicative, you, they say, say what? You say imperative, I don't, what are you talking about? And then you say, well, you know, there's another mood. Well, I got a bad mood right now Listen to all this grammar talk. Now, there's another mood, and that's subjunctive. And all y'all know that. You know these kind of things because you've studied your native language some, you've studied other languages, you've studied the German language, and you say, oh, I 
Get what he's saying. And so indicatives describe, in case you missed it in your language courses, indicatives describe what is true, what is real, what is factual, what is solid and you can count on. It's not hypothetical. It's not possible. It's not potential. It's real. The indicative is a declaration of what has happened. And so I'm talking to you as people who know these terms and can apply them in biblical studies. And that's why I sent to you earlier this week in PDF this little booklet, there's some copies downstairs, that give you a color-coded key and bold face and italics and all kinds of wonderful things for the grammar nerds to be able to do some study in Ephesians and say, I see that, I see that, I see that. And seeing that... I hope that enriches your heart and also encourages you to put those things into practice. See, these are the things that are true that God has done. See, and and theologically, these are the things that God has truly done. The indicative is the foundation for the imperative. That is, the fact and the reality is the foundation for the obedience to the command. John Murray, in his commentary on the epistle to the Romans, says this. He says, To say to the slave who has not been freed, do not behave as a slave, is to mock his enslavement. But to say the same words to the slave who has been set free is the necessary command which puts into effect the privileges and rights of his liberation. Did you follow that? Did you catch that? Act like a free man. You say to someone in prison, I can't do that. You're mocking me. But to someone who has been liberated, when you say, live as a free man, live as a free woman, that command puts into operation the privileges and the rights of his liberation. That's good news. The indicative precedes the imperative. And in Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, we get all kinds of glorious and blessed indicatives. And in chapters 4 through 6, we get all kinds of glorious and blessed imperatives. And we'll be looking at that. You see, chapters 1 through 3 in Ephesians tells us about orthodoxy which is a a fancy Greek-derived word that means right thinking. Right thinking, orthodoxy. But chapters 4 through 6 leads us into orthopraxy, which you know when you go to the, the the doctor's praxis here. This is where you put it into practice. This is right thinking and right behavior. This is right belief, chapters 1 through 3. And then how do we behave in light of what we confess we believe? The indicatives precede the imperatives. And we see this pattern again and again and again in the scriptures. And so we put it before you today. Our former status in Adam. If you look at Ephesians chapter 2, there's some really, really, really bad news in Ephesians chapter 2. Because Paul is telling us indicatives, telling us those things that are true. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, He says, and you were dead. Really? You were dead? That's what Paul says to the Ephesian believers. You were dead. There was a point in time in the past when you were dead. And they all walked around and pinched themselves and said... I don't remember ever being dead. I've been, as lo- been alive as, as long as I can remember. What are you talking about, Paul? Do you believe that? You were dead? You know, we just sang it today. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening, a life-giving ray to the dead. And I I rose, my dungeon flamed in light. My chains fell off. The The slave was liberated. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed three. The indicative precedes the action of the imperative. 
Christ makes us alive and he calls us to follow him. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you once walked the past. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Wow. What's he describing here? Is it physical death? No, not physical death, but a spiritual death. Death is describing this vast gulf that separates fallen humanity, sinful humanity, from a holy and righteous eternal God. You were dead. Paul sees such a transformation in life in Adam and life in Christ that throughout his letters he refers to this in the stark, high contrast, high definition terms of death and life. You were dead in your transgressions, your trespasses and sins. He says in verse 3 of chapter 2, we were, and notice how we, he identifies himself with this group now, we were by nature children of wrath. And he's saying, I, I, I'm, I'm not a child of wrath, I'm the son of Chuck and Vanus. No, I was a child of wrath. And that's where you get to play the genitive game. The children of wrath are those children who deserve wrath. Children worthy of, deserving of wrath. Children who are described by an experience that they deserve of the wrath of God. Now, you've got to believe that. This is our former state. This is where we were. At one point, we were helpless and hopeless and deserving of the wrath and punishment of a holy God. Chapter 2 and verse 12. Remember that you were, past tense again at that time, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise. He's talking specifically here in this context to those Gentiles that are in Ephesus and the surrounding villages and reminding them that at the time before Christ came, that was their lot. They were separated from Christ they had no connection with Christ. They had no claim to Christ. They had no portion in Christ. They were separated. They were alienated. You know, that's one of the great things, again, about this church. We, we understand what it means to be an alien, those of us who are not Germans, okay? And I'm not talking about woo -doo 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 -doo. you're some sort of space creature, of course. But aliens means that I am registered as an alien resident of Germany. And so are you if you're not a citizen of this country. Alienated from the commonwealth, the government, the surrounding realm of blessing that is described as Israel. Strangers. Strangers. You know, knocks on your door. I don't know you. Go away. Strangers to the covenants of promise. That was our situation. We were once far off. Describes this in terms of distance in chapter 2 and verse 13. And in verse 14, he describes this conflict between Jew and Gentile, which is a conflict that is ongoing today, not only between Jew and Gentile, but between Gentile and Gentile. He says in verse 14 that he has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, and he created in himself verse 15, one new man in place of the two, making peace, bringing Jew and Gentile together in one body so that we see, as in the book of Revelation, the glorious picture of many tongues and tribes and nations and peoples praising God together. God is accomplishing that. He created in himself one new man in place of the two, making peace, and he says at the end of verse 16, thereby killing the hostility. Our previous status, dead in Adam, walking in sins and trespasses, deserving of wrath, separated, aliens, strangers, hostile. That's bad news. And it's at that moment that you say, I need some counsel. 
I need to know what's happening here. And this is the, the story of the scripture. God paints a picture of our need for Christ. And we see that need, and he tells us what he's done for us in Christ, and then what the result is. In your bulletin today, there is a little insert that has metaphors in it. And Natalia is going to show us part of this right now. This is just a collection, and there's a lot of them on here. These are just ones that I've selected from Ephesians for us today. These are metaphors in the Bible. These are word pictures that describe what happened to us. On the left column, there's a, a different context for the word picture. And you can see that individual life, social life, family, government, abstract ideas. These are ways in which you can identify an area in which the gospel can make impact. See, some people say, I've, I've never felt, felt alienated. But they say, but I sure know what it means to be in debt. I've, I've, never, I've never felt uh, exposed to wrath, but you know, I know what it is to be in darkness. And so each of these word pictures can be an avenue for you to communicate through your life and your words into someone else's life. And so you see in this picture, in the first picture of the blue column, there's the fall, men and Adam. What, what are we like? And just look, we've already looked at these. Dead, alienated, lonely, exposed to wrath. In terms of marriage, single or separated, stranger, disinherited, an alien, again a foreigner, far off and in darkness. I've included some also from 1 John because we'll be looking at 1 John in several weeks. But what's the action taken? This is about where we're going to go in this next part of the message. What did God do? There's the fall, and then there's redemption, and then restoration. The action that God took, he made us alive. He associated, he incorporated, he propitiated, he appeased. He wedded us, he wooed us, he adopted us. He included us in his testament or his will. He naturalized us and made us citizens, fellow citizens, with the saints. He's brought us near. He's brought us into the light. And so in that next column of the new man in Christ, we see that we are now in Christ. We are alive. We're in covenant partnership. We're, even though we deserve wrath, we've received favor. And we are the bride of Christ, the son of God, the heir with Christ of all things, citizens in a heavenly kingdom, near to God, and we are in the light. I, I encourage you to take this, and you know, there's extra copies at the back, and, and if you want one, if you miss out on this, take this and read this over and see the different ways in which the New Testament describes this transformation that takes place because what we were does not rightly describe what we are. We were once darkness, now we are light in the Lord. So what did God do? What did God do? And this is why on the front of the bulletin today it says, it is finished. Because what God did does not need anything from us added to it to make it real, to make it right, to make it complete. God accomplished for his people salvation. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 3, if you've been with me in small groups, if you've been with us in the service, you know already that Ephesians 1.3 is one of my treasured favorite verses in the New Testament. Blessed be, praise be to whom? The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Who has blessed us, past tense, completed action. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's a fact. That's a fact. This is what God has done. He has blessed us. Now, I know that it's a pattern of our prayer life sometimes to say, God bless the missionary. God bless me, bless my, bless this, bless that, bless this. And that's okay. But keep in mind, 
God has already blessed you. If you're in Christ, he's blessed you with 38% of the spiritual blessings. 48%? No. Every spiritual blessing God has already given to you. You just haven't opened up your treasure chest to find out what's in there. And that's the task of the Christian. We're not trying to please God so that we can get blessings. We're just saying, look what he's given. Oh, my. And we open it up and we explore. He has blessed us. Verse 4, even as he chose us. Verse 5, in love he predestined us. And, you know, these, these concepts go together. God has blessed us, God chose us, God has predestined us. Some of you might like, like those words chose and predestined, but I think you do like the word blessed. And they go together. And, and you can't get around the fact that the Bible does teach plainly and clearly a message of election and choosing and providence and predestination. That God, the almighty creator, the alpha and the omega, that he of his own initiative and out of his love has rescued some from sin and death, some who were deserving of wrath. God says, I save you. The good news of the gospel is the three most important words of the English language, and Oseas knows them by heart because they're easy. God saves sinners. We don't save ourselves. We don't work ourselves up to get in the place where God says, well done, good, now, now I like you. I used to not like you, but now I like you. You've turned out pretty good. No, God says, you are deserving of wrath, but out of my mercy in Christ, I bring you near. I make you my very own. He's redeemed us, verse 7. In him, we have redemption through his blood. Notice that, that's a present tense. We have redemption. Not we're gonna have redemption, or we might get redemption, subjunctive mood, but we have redemption in his blood. And he's, he's included us in his will. And have you ever received an inheritance, you have a relative who dies and leaves things to you, and you're named in the will, and it says in him, in Christ, we've obtained an inheritance. And that's by virtue of our adoption. Born into the Henderson family, I had no rights to a heavenly inheritance. Born into Adam, I had only rights to death. But in Christ, I have rights. I haven't been included in that. Have you ever been to a reading of the will? It's one of the most boring things in the world, unless your name is in it. <laughs> and you're tuned in. Oh, okay. oh, what did I get? Well... This is why we call this the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is God's will. This is God's testament, what he's leaving behind to us in Christ. We have obtained an inheritance. What has God done? God has raised his own son from the dead. Verse 19, that power is in us, he says in verse 19 of chapter 1. His power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. God raised his son from the dead. Not only did he raise him from the dead, but he has seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. God has done this as a vindication of the work and the ministry and the death and burial, the sacrifice of the Son of God. This is what God has accomplished. You can't add to that. You can enjoy that. You can discover what that means for you, but you cannot add to that. And, and notice in verse 21 of chapter 1. He has seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above. We're not talking about stratosphere, but we're talking about a hierarchy of authority. Far above all rule and authority, and power, and dominion. Huh. There's something going on. There's something that is a conflict in the heavenly places. And God the Father has seated his Son 
in a position of ultimate authority far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And not only that, but above every name that is named, those on earth and those in this age and the, and the one to come. And God the Father has also put all things under his feet, which doesn't mean a lot to you and me because what do we have under our feet? Carpet, footstools. But what does that mean? Again, that's a metaphor, a figure of speech that describes the ultimate authority of the Son of God. Everything is under his feet, under his rule, and this is the individual whom God has given, given as head over all things to the church. Not to Siemens, not to BMV, not to Lufthansa, not to the Bundesregierung, but God has given Jesus Christ as head over all things to the church, to his people, his body, and that's us. You see what God has done? What God has accomplished? It gets better. Remember chapter 2 and verse 1, you were dead? But God... Every time you see a but God in the Bible, jump up and down. Highlight it, underline it, make it 72-point bold in italics. Do something with it. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. What did God do? But God made us alive together with Christ. If you're in Christ, you know what? You're alive. Because you're in Christ. Not because of anything you have done. Not because of anything you've accomplished or earned. Anything you've achieved. No. It's because of Christ. And he's raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly places. We've been through this exercise before. Where are you seated right now? Manny, where are you seated? I'm in a chair. I'm Mozart Strasse 12. It's in you know, Landkreis München in uh, Bayern. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, no, Manny, where are you seated? Manny is seated in the heavenly places in Christ. Isn't that amazing? We sang about that too. <laughs> no condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine, alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. <laughs> you know, when you look in the mirror, do you see righteousness? Yeah, it's kind of mixed, isn't it? But the declaration of the gospel is the good news that we are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, the Savior of the world. That's good news. He's made us alive. He's raised us. He's seated us. Verse 13 says that we've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 14 says that we have been made one. We have been reconciled. Reconciled to God, reconciled to others. There's no, there's no cause for us to have strife between nations and ethnicities in the church of Jesus Christ. There's no reason for that. It remains because we're still sinful, fleshly people. But God has made provision for that. And so we ought to be able to walk in that way. That's next week. Learning to live according to who we really are in Christ is what the gospel lifestyle is about. And so we've seen who we were, our old status in Adam, where we were helpless and hopeless without Christ in the world, without hope. And yet God acted. God saves sinners. God acted to rescue ruined, wrath-deserving, sinful men and women to rescue from the impending wrath and to bring us into a, a place of safety, a place of security, a place of redemption, a place of hope because we're no longer in Adam, but we are in Christ. That is critical for you. For those of you who want to do a little bit denser study, there's something downstairs, which uh, there were a few copies remaining the last time I looked, a little article by John Murray, again. Uh, John Murray was a remarkable man, and I've titled this, Christ is All, How Our Union with Christ Drives Our Obedience. We're joined to Christ, and these are the indicatives that make the 
obedience to the imperatives possible. You can pick this up, and it's a, like I said, it's kind of dense, but it's rewarding as you read through this and understand what it is that God has done for us, because God's finished work on our behalf grants us a new status, a new identity, and a new calling in Christ, a new destiny. Again, we go back to chapter 1, verse 5. Your new status, my new status in Christ is adopted sons, verse 5. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us, has blessed us in the beloved. Adoption. See, it's one thing to say you're forgiven. It's one thing to say you don't have to go to jail. It's one thing to say you're not going to experience the wrath of the eternal God. But it's a completely different thing more glorious thing to say not only that but this you are invited into the judges the king's home and he has given you full and complete rights as a son and an heir you're adopted into the family not just living debt free but now you have infinite resources at your disposal adoption again verse 11 we've obtained an inheritance we're adopted and now we are heirs Verse 22, chapter 1, who's your head? Doesn't that sound weird? Weird English. Who is your head? You know, sometimes parents will say to their children, where is your head? And of course we know where the head is. It's right here at the top end of the neck. But who is your head? That is, who is responsible for you? Who is the one who God has placed to be responsible for you. Who is your head? Jesus Christ. We sang about it. Alive in him, my living head. That is to say, everything that I have comes from Christ. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. And I'm responsible to him as my head, my king, my Lord. And we are his body. And the body operates at the direction, at the impulse of the head. Christ gives direction to his body. And he's given us direction, those imperatives, because we are his body. Chapter 2 and verse 10, we are his workmanship. Again, you look in the mirror, you think, workmanship? You know, it's like the guy who said, oh, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Really? Maybe a reasonably well-maintained Presbyterian youth center, but not a temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are his. We are his body. We are his workmanship created. And what's the sphere of our creation? In Christ Jesus, dead in Adam, alive in Christ Jesus, created in Christ Jesus for a purpose, for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk, live our lives in them. We're his workmanship. Verse 19 of chapter 2, we've got a heavenly passport. We're fellow citizens with the saints. We're not talking about St. Augustine. We're talking about every generation of faithful men and women rescued from wrath by the work of the Father, through the death of the Son, by the gift of the Spirit, all of these factors working together to accomplish what God wants to do for us in Christ. And we are also being built that's a present reality. We are a building under construction. We are his body, but we're also a building under construction, being joined together. And so we as a group are being joined, fitted together into a holy temple in the Lord. That's a dynamic truth of the New Testament. You individually 
are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells in you individually, but we together as the body of Christ are being built together, Peter calls us, living stones being shaped and formed together as a dwelling place for God. We are a holy temple. In chapter 3, there is a chapter 3. Gentiles, verse 6, that's us. Don't think we have any people with an ethnic heritage and Jewishness in our congregation today. Gentiles are fellow heirs, verse 6, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And so because of that, because of what God has done and given us this new identity, this new status, this new calling, this new destiny, he says to us in verse 11, in Christ Jesus our Lord, in verse 12, we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. We have, again, present tense, we have confidence, boldness, access. In Christ. Some of you work in areas where at least you have to have a key card to get into your office space. Perhaps it might have a little key card plus a second level where you punch something in to gain access to an office space. Perhaps some of you are extremely high tech and you have to look into the thing and get a retinal scan to make sure it's really you. And it goes, eh, 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 not authorized to enter. Verboten. Wow. In Christ, you know what we got? We have Jesus' retinal scan. We have Jesus' key card. We have his passcode. And that means that we have boldness and confidence and access to the Father because of our standing in grace. We have that access that even if you see a sign that says, no admittance, authorized personnel only, you say, huh, I got it. And you walk up and you have access. Do you ever hesitate to go to the throne of God in prayer? Don't. You have bold, confident access in Christ. That's what God has given you. That's your new status in Christ. Take advantage of it. But why? Why did God do all of this? Now, would God have been just to say, I've had it with all y'all? Whoosh, wave after wave of wrath and destruction. Would God be just to do that? This is the time when you say yes, because we were guilty, undeserving sinners. And God, but God, being great in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive. But why? Important words for you you for me it's not all about you well, gee you know I must be really special God wanted me on his team you know some of you remember those childhood traumas of being selected you're the big guy you're on my team you know, you're the little runt you know, you know, you know. yeah I've been passed over in those kinds of elections and you have too but God didn't do that because you were special. God did that. He tells us three times in chapter 1, for the praise of his glorious grace. For the praise of his glorious grace. God redeeming ruined sinners gives glory to his name because he's revealed as a gracious, saving, redeeming God. He gets glory. But it's more than that. In chapter 1, we already saw that God gave Christ as head to the church. And he's over what? All rule and authority and power and dominion. He did that so that we might be built together as a holy temple in which he would dwell. 
I want to cheat a little bit. May I go to chapter 6? Chapter 6 and verse 12, Paul reminds the Ephesians and us, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Who do we wrestle against? The rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Again, there's this cosmic battle going on, and God has brought us out of darkness into light to be his in the midst of that. But we're going to end here in chapter 3 and verse 10 today. Paul describes that this mystery that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. And of that mystery, that is to say, it wasn't revealed in the Old Testament in its completion. The covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 talked about, in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. But he says now, it's been made evident, revealed in chapter 3 and verse 5. He says, This grace was given, verse 8, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery, hidden for ages in God who created all things. And then Paul comes to that moment when he, you get the answer to the why. Why is so that? So that I've done all of this. I've revealed the mystery. I've rescued people out of darkness, brought them into light, made them alive in my son. So that through the church, let that sink in. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the people of Munich? No, no. To the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You and I, in the hands of God, are players on a stage with divine design to display to the rulers and authorities and powers and dominions in the heavenly places that God is a God of grace and love and mercy. He is a God who saves. He is a God who saves to the uttermost. He is a God who saves and sanctifies. He is a God who brings people undeserving near and makes them his heirs. And God is doing that has been doing that for 2,000 years through the church. Each day, each day, you and I have the opportunity to live by the good news of the gospel and to display the manifold wisdom as the church of Jesus Christ in this world. We have that opportunity to do that. But we also sadly have the opportunity to refuse to live according to the gospel, to live instead by human scheming and human falsehood. And when we do that, the church displays not the manifold wisdom. Your life displays not the manifold wisdom of God, but the manifold foolishness of sinful man. Each day, we do that. Each week in small groups, in Bible studies, in public worship, we do that in all of our communication. And you say, oh, well, you know, I'm in my apartment and I'm on the fifth floor and I live alone and nobody knows what I'm doing. Uh-huh. The rulers and authorities and powers and dominions. You're putting on display the manifold wisdom of God or the manifold foolishness of man. The indicatives really do matter. Next week, we'll tackle the imperatives. Let's bow. Father, thank you. Thank you that you've done such wondrous things for us in Christ. Thank you that we, simply by saying, yes, Lord, I trust you, Lord. I, I, your testimony is true, that we are counted among those who are in Christ. We turn from our dead works and we turn to Christ. We recognize that everything that we want, everything that we have, everything that we will ever be is bound up in that one person, our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so we say thank you. We thank you for all that you've done. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we close our time of gathered worship, I just want to again remind you um, that there's two gentlemen in the back with baskets for the benevolence offering. Thank you also uh, to the faithfulness that you display in the stewardship of the resources God has entrusted to you and how you make financial tangible investments into his kingdom through your ongoing regular giving to this church so that the gospel can not only be shared here, but can go forth from here. So thank you so much for your faithfulness. Uh, in closing, I want to um, read the benediction out of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him, that's him, God, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Father, thank you for this time of investing and reminding and refreshment. Father, I want to ask that we would walk in this confidence of who we are in Christ and that our lives, our words, our actions may be a reflection of your glorious beauty and not man's ingenuity. May we go from here encouraged, challenged, and with a new vigor to proclaim the excellences of the one who has called us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Go in peace. See you next week.